questions. So, sorry, to answer a question, you can click on the Q&A tab that's at the bottom of your screen. Uh, so you can go ahead and type in your question or comment and click send there. We also have an upvote feature where you can like another person's question. This will move the question up the queue and prompt us to answer it faster. We've set aside uh, time at the end of this webinar to answer your questions. Uh, just as a reminder, we will prioritize questions that are related to the topic at hand. Uh, we'll also do our best to answer other questions, time permitting. Uh, we've scheduled some extra time today to try to ensure that we get to everyone's questions, but we're hoping to give you back a bit of time at the end um, of the webinar today. Now, if your question is very specific to your own business needs, or if we run out of time today, please feel free to reach out to our compliance and registry team. You can reach them by email at registry at rpra.ca. We'll also share today's slides with you via email, and the webinar recording will also be made available online for you. So uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass it on to RPRA's registrar, Mary Cummins, and, and as well as, excuse me, Blue Box coordinator, Sydney Baker. Uh, so take it away, Mary. Thank you very much, Monica, and thank you everyone for coming today. Um, <clears throat> what, I, what I really want to cover in, in today's uh, webinar is what producers need to know in order to be ready and to comply for July 1st, 2023, which is the date that the Blue Box program begins transitioning. So if you're you're here today and, and you're a municipality or one of the service providers, I'm sure you will, will get information that might help you understand the regulation better. But really the focus is producers understanding their obligations on what they need to do in preparation for July 1st, 2023, what they should be doing today and thinking about today if they've not already done so, and a little bit of coverage in terms of how RPRA is approaching compliance with the requirements on July 1st, 2023 for producers. So it is a, a very specific uh, focus and objective that, that I want to work through. Next slide. So to start with, uh, we're just going to sort of level set for everyone in case there's some new folks on the, the line that haven't joined some of our previous webinars in terms of what is IPR, what is individual producer responsibility, especially in the context of the blue box regulation. The, the principle of IPR is a shift from what a lot of companies will be used to in Ontario when they were working under the Waste Diversion Act or the Waste Diversion Transition Act working with Stewardship Ontario or CSSA for their Ontario obligations. That's where the, the producer stewards under those Stewardship Ontario rules had obligations to sign in to, to the We Recycle portal, report data, pay a fee, and for the most part, that satisfied their obligations. Stewardship Ontario took over from there. Individual producer responsibility is a new framework in Ontario. Uh, although not, not as new as, as we, we can probably keep saying, it has been out for, for about five years now, uh, which means producers now, previously called stewards, are responsible for collecting and managing their products and or packaging at the end of the life. So what that means is that it's not just about a producer signing into to a portal, reporting their supply data uh, and, and paying a fee. There's other obligations that a producer needs to make sure that they've taken care of in order for the system to work. And we're going to talk a little bit about what those are in terms of individual producers' responsibilities. And really the key thing is how you can fulfill them, because it is more than just signing into the, the We Recycle portal and, and reporting. Next slide. To do that, just to, to, as part of this background information, let's just talk a little bit about some of the key players so that when, as we're going through these decks, you can understand some of the, the roles that different people play. So you have the Ontario government, the ministry, they are the ones that developed this policy and this framework. Uh, so, so RPRA is unable to answer questions about why this framework, why this policy, why this exclusion. Uh, it, it's really the ministry who develops that and, and sets that framework up. And then once it's passed into to law, it turns it over to, to Resource Productivity Recovery Authority or RIPRA to actually implement and enforce the regulations. Specifically, we do so, and we're gonna talk about this very specific in the context of Blue Box later in this presentation. We're doing so by taking activities much like any other regulator that you may have to deal with. So anyone who's worked with CRA, for instance, in their, their business may be familiar with inspections, audits, investigations, you may get orders. 
uh, the CRA operates like a regulator, much like our PRA. There's other regulators as well at the provincial level that you may have had interactions with. But our PRA is not the person or the company that's going to help you be able to fulfill all of your obligations, uh, nor, nor are we your uh, IFO. The, the stewardship Ontario. So, so I know I hear sometimes from producers, but I've registered with RIPRA. I'm done now. Um, RIPRA is the beginning of this journey. So you're registering and you're reporting to RIPRA in order for us to tell you what your obligations are under the obligation or under the regulations. And then we're using that data that we've collected to ensure it's accurate. And we're using inspections and audits and investigations. And if you're not fulfilling the obligations that you're required to under the, uh, the regulation, we have a variety of compliance tools and enforcement tools available to us, which we will also speak to later on. Next slide. And you have producers who, who I hope are the majority of the folks on this call right now. Producer is a bit of a misleading term sometimes because a lot of producers think, but I don't produce anything. Uh, really a producer is somebody who is supplying items. Uh, they, they're the person in the hierarchy of each of the regulations identified. So it could be the, the brand owner uh, of a package or a product. It could be a letter somebody is sending with their brand on it. The idea is that a producer is anyone who supplies obligated materials into Ontario. There's a hierarchy that we, we've got. There's other webinars that speak to the blue box producer hierarchy. So if you're not sure if your company is in fact a producer in the hierarchy or what materials to report, we do have webinars covering that. Uh, but we also can uh, have, have the team available to help you work that through. But I just want to make sure that folks don't hear the term producer and think, well, I don't produce anything. So we do hear that quite frequently. And really, it's about whether or not you're supplying obligated materials. And you'll see this pro, producer responsibility organizations. Uh, they are much like previously the Stewardship of Ontario. The difference is now is that there, there are more than one of them. Producers have choice in terms of which producer responsibility organization they want to join to assist them in meeting their regulatory obligations. Uh, unlike in the previous construct and framework where you had to join the Stewardship Ontario framework, or you had to join for those of you who might've had obligations in other programs, Ontario Electronic Stewardship. Now there's choice in the regulations in terms of who you work with in order to satisfy your obligations. And then there's also processors. We're going to talk about that as well. Processors are, are companies uh, that are set up in order to, to provide services to producer responsibility organizations on behalf of the producers in order to recycle products and, and packaging. What you'll note here is the IFO has no, no role to play in the new framework. So Stewardship Ontario or CSSA is not on this list, but what's important for producers to understand is there are still obligations under the Waste Diversion Transition Act to your IFO for, for Blue Box? So that's to Stewardship Ontario, CSSA, via the We Recycle portal. Um, there are still payment of fees required. You can talk to, to your IFO about what your obligations under the WDTA look like. That's not for today. Today is the forward looking. And the reason you have obligations under both is this is a transition. So you're going to have obligations to cover previous years, this is about looking forward in terms of what your obligations are on a go forward basis. Next slide. So what are your requirements? At a, a very high level, uh, Blue Box producers have, sorry, if we could just go back to the title slide for just a moment, perfect. Three high level requirements that beyond registration and reporting. So, so this is, you come in, you register with RPRA, you report your, your information to RPRA, and that is what we use to determine what are your management, collection, and promotion and education requirements. So registration and reporting is just the first step to actually determine what type of producer you are and what your obligations are under the blue box regulation. Very important. Registration and reporting to RIPRA is the beginning of the journey, not the end. Now, next slide. So let's dive into each of these a little bit more. Management requirements. So it's calculated based on a formula and the regulation, but really it's about your supply data. So how much of that obligated blue box material did you supply into the Ontario market? 
that's going to drive a management a calculation requirement for you that is then going to follow through with all of your other potential obligations. So it's important to note that some producers will log in, register, report, and they actually might be done at that point because they may get uh, an output from our registry portal that says you have no management requirements. There's thresholds in the regulation uh, that, that if you supply uh, less than a particular amount of kilograms of that obligated blue box material into Ontario, you do have to register and report to us, but it's going to actually tell you at the end, you have no management requirements, and therefore that flows through to many obligations that you wouldn't have. So it is the first step, as I said, but for some, it ends there. Uh, and the registry itself is going to tell you that. So when you interact with our registry, the electronic portal where you're reporting the supply data, it's actually going to tell you what your different obligations are. It's really important to note. So if you're someone who's on this call who is a producer, you've logged in, you've registered, you've reported your supply data, paid your, your fee to RPRA, that fee is for regulating you. That fee is not for meeting your obligations. And at the end of the process, you have no management requirements. You are actually good. Uh, you you do not need to, 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 to consider other requirements that you may have. You have audit retention, you're still subject to our inspections. We can still determine whether or not that data is correct. We'll talk about what that means to, to RIPRA in terms of what a free rider is in a little bit, uh, but your obligation would end there. For a lot of producers though, they go through this process and the registry is going to give them what their management requirements are. And if you have management requirements, you also have, next slide, collection system requirements. So any producer with management requirements needs to establish and operate a curbside and depot collection system in Ontario. What does that mean? It means at a high level, and we're just talking about high level, we won't get into the detail of during transition, post transition, all these, these sort of things. Really what it means is if you have a management requirement, you are going to have obligations to service Ontario residents with curbside recycling. To, to physically make sure blue bins are set up across the province, trucks are showing up and picking up from people's residences. We also have depot requirements. So if a community had collection depots, so, so some folks would be familiar with that, where they're taking uh, the residents taking their, their blue box to a depot as opposed to a curbside collection, there are requirements to set that up as well. Each individual producer needs to be able to demonstrate that they've satisfied the obligations to have a curbside and depot collection system for all of Ontario if you've got management requirements. Now, don't, before anyone who's concerned about that, about how am I going to do that, that's today's webinar. We're going to talk about how you can actually satisfy that requirement. Next slide. Note on supplemental collection systems. So every producer has to make sure that this curbside collection system is being operated and established for all of Ontario residents, that there's depot collection systems available. But the regulation also allows producers to operate something called a supplemental system. And supplemental is exactly what it means, supplemental to that curbside collection system. It's not instead of. So what happens is if you're a company who perhaps has, has set up a, a curbside collection program. And again, we're going to talk about how you do that for, for all of the millions of residents in Ontario. And you also have a system that you're running where you're getting material back from your own consumers. Uh, it, there's lots of different ways that you can think of as an own, as, as average consumer that you might even participate in something like this in your own home. Where, where you're participating in some sort of system where a, a business, a producer, is attempting to get material back from you, their consumer. Those are supplemental, supplemental to the curbside. Producers still have the obligation to run a curbside program and ensure that they're participating in that. The supplemental system is in addition to it it's because they want to get that material back. The bonus for running a supplemental system is that any of the material collected through it can count towards your management requirements. So you may want to operate a supplemental system as a service to your consumers already or to your resident to, to your consumers already. And if you do so, the bonus is that you're actually going to be able to count that material to your management requirements. 
or you may be doing it because you need to run a supplemental system in order to meet your management requirements. How you figure that out, how you determine that you're going to meet those management requirements, again, we're going to talk about in just a, just a little bit. But I think you're a producer is beginning to, to potentially see, okay, so there's a curbside collection. I have to have that set up. I have to have that system running, including depots. I could have a supplemental collection system as well if I'm concerned about meeting my management requirements and wanting to supplement the material that was recycled and collected via the curbside collection system. How am I going to do it? Those are the questions that you should be asking now. Next slide. Then there's an alternative collection system. An alternative is exactly what it means. Alternative to the curbside collection system. It is possible uh, to have a completely alternative collection system to that of the curbside system. Uh, whether or not a producer can actually have one of these, have it up and running, I would strongly encourage if you think you have an alternative collection system to contact our compliance team to discuss that and not rely on the idea of that alternative collection system to satisfy your obligations until you had that conversation with us. Uh, for the most part, every producer is going to be needing to participate in this curbside collection system. Next slide. And you have promotion and education. Really what this gets down to is you've got this curbside collection system, all of the millions of residents getting their blue bins picked up. You've got the depots for residents to drop it off. Those are requirements for you to have. Maybe you have a supplemental system. You also have promotion and education requirements to tell producer, to tell Ontario consumers and residents what to put in, what is recyclable, what is accepted. These are advertising campaigns, educational numbers, whatever, whatever might exist. Right now, any resident in Ontario might be familiar with the idea of maybe you, you your blue bin wasn't picked up next one week and you had to call, or maybe you got something stuck on your blue bin telling you something you put in there wasn't supposed to be in there. Producers are now responsible for running those sort of education campaigns to make sure Ontario consumers know what can go into the blue bin. Next slide. So this is what I've been alluding to. So now you've got this idea of these are the, I've registered, I've reported, I didn't have management requirements, I'm good. I did get management requirements. What, what do I do? How do I meet all of these different requirements? At a minimum, I know I have to have a curbside depot collection system across this entire province. Maybe the, the, the supplemental system if I have one as well. How am I actually going to do this? Next slide. There are really two ways. Uh, you can establish your own system and that would involve, uh, yes, for figuring out how to provide services to every Ontario resident. Uh, potentially operating a completely alternative system to that curbside collection system. Uh, so that, that is one option to available to producers. To do that, I strongly recommend that you contact the compliance and registry team to discuss with us how you intend to have that set up for July 1st and what that will look like and how you're going to individually comply with that requirement. Alternatively, you can work with a pro. So we talked about what pros are before. They're, they're sort of like IFOs, but now there's a few of them for each of the regulations. They are companies that have uh, been set up in order to provide compliance services to producers to say, we can do everything that you need to do. And, and if you sign up with me, I'm going to do it on your behalf. What's really important is you, still your obligation as an individual producer. So even if you choose this option, and the vast majority of producers will choose the option of working with pros as opposed to attempting to either set up millions of curbside collection system and depot requirements or alternative collection systems. Most producers will choose to work with pros. Uh, the obligation is still yours. So going back to what I was saying as a producer, what am I doing right now to be ready? Registered, I've reported. I either know I have my management requirement if I don't. Got that off ramp built into the regulation that if my management requirements, if my supply data is low enough, that, that it actually off ramps me and says, you don't have a management requirement, therefore you don't have collection requirements or PE requirements. So there's nothing further you have to do there. But if you're continuing on that journey and yes, you do have management requirements, you have to set up a curbside collection system, depot system, all of that. I'm gonna work with a pro, you, you 
know that that you want to work with a pro and you hire a pro because you have choices. These are private business arrangements for a person not involved in these conversations. They are between a producer and their service provider. The same way that you might engage as a company with finding somebody to fulfill your obligations to the CRA, it is up to you as that company to ensure whoever you're signing up with can fulfill your obligations to CRA. It's the same here. It is up to you as a producer to ensure the pro that you identify to fulfill your obligations will be able to fulfill your obligations. So it's an important component as well to this framework that's different than, than, than previously existed, which is that you need to engage. You have accountability here. You need to make sure whoever you're identifying to be your pro in blue box regulation or any regulation can fulfill those obligations on your behalf, just like you would when you're selecting an individual to, to interact with the CRA. All of that needs to be in place for July 1st, 2023. So producers should not wait until June 30th of 2023 to figure this out. It is a system that needs to be fully operational in terms of there is a transition period. So there's different chunks of the province going at different times, but it is a system that needs to be in place if you have those obligations on July 1st, 2023. If you are not engaging with a pro today to figure out how they can fulfill your obligations, you need to be, or you're engaging with the compliance team to discuss how you're going to be able to do it on your own. Next slide. So why is this important? What happens on July 1st, 2023 in terms of uh, RPRA as your regulator and your individual performance and accountability for the blue box program? What I wanna do is talk a little bit about our compliance framework so you can understand the risk and, and do your own risk analysis in terms of what that means for July 1st, 2023 for your company. Next slide. So a lot of companies will be familiar with this term of a free rider. And what is a free rider? A free rider to our PRA is three different things. One, a company that is not registered or reported to RIPRA or did so incorrectly. So you may register and report and then report your supply data knowingly or unknowingly so low that you, you look as though you're exempt from management requirements, but you actually are not. So even if you register and report, but do so incorrectly, RIPRA considers you a free rider. Free riders are getting a free ride on the system. So you can see how that would be the case. The second, the second tranche, if you will, of free riders are those who registered, reported, did so correctly, have management requirements, but have not established the collection and management system they're required to do so. What that means is on July 1st of 2023, if you cannot demonstrate to your regulator, our PRA, that you have established the collection and management system required by the regulation, you would be considered a free rider under this regulation to your regulator. Lastly is operating it. So not just establishing it. So July 1st, that trigger comes on and is it actually established? Then it actually has to work. And that's the operating. Equally, if that's not occurring, you're considered a free rider. Why is it important for me to tell you right now what your regulator considers a free rider? Next slide. This is how RPRA assesses risk to the system and to the programs. It's a simple risk matrix. And we use it in order to make sure that we're utilizing our resources effectively and efficiently and to make sure that the success of these regulations occur. So as an example, if you've sent in an email to, to the registry team before, and your question might be assessed as being in the green zone here. Your question may get answered on a longer time frame than if your question was in the top right-hand hand, right hand quadrant of this matrix. So it's how we assess our, our resources on a day-to-day -day basis with our questions. It's how we prepare material. So if somebody has questions saying, what are your audit requirements in 2027 when I'm pre submitting performance requirements that might come down lower on the matrix in terms of us responding to questions. Free riders is in the top right hand quadrant here, that very top right hand high likelihood, high impact box. Uh, and we've defined what a free rider is. 
We also use this risk matrix not just to assess our resources, and this is one of the reasons we're having this webinar today, so we're putting resources into addressing free riders, putting resources into having conversations with producers about what is a free rider and how to avoid being a free rider, because this matrix also will allow you to predict the response from your regulator for particular types of contraventions. So free riders, top right-hand matrix, that will tell you what sort of responses you might get if you're, you're in those buckets. So to, to give you an illustration, you're a producer and let's say, say you reported one day late. That's gonna go on, on the bottom area of the matrix there compared to your producer who has no participation in the collection and management system. And in, in effect, on July 1st, you become a free rider. You're in the top right-hand matrix. Our response, and we're gonna go through our compliance tools here, are going to be very much so based on where you're fitting in that matrix. Next slide. So here are the different tools available to us. The key, the one we use all of the time, every day, the one I'm using right now in this minute is proactive education and awareness. Educating producers on what you need to do in order to comply. That is our number one compliance tool. The bottom line is if producers understand what they need to do to comply, we've removed any barrier for them to comply uh, and we've made it as simple as possible for them to comply, they will comply. <laughs> so, so that's the approach that we're taking with this proactive education and awareness. And then we have inspection and audit tools available to us. You'll note this is sort of a progressive approach to, to compliance. So we can ask questions. Producers are legally required uh, to, to respond to our questions within the time frame that we ask them. Then there's also communications to address non-compliance. So what that might look like is what we're about to start doing in the next coming weeks, which is contacting any producer who is at risk of being a free rider on July 1st, 2023. So you're not out of compliance yet. You are not yet a free rider if you've registered, reported, and done so correctly, but you haven't yet told us how you're going to comply on July 1st. So you have the potential to, to be in a non-compliance situation. We're going to be doing individual outreach to you to determine what your system and what your plan is for July 1st so that we don't get to July 1st and you have a reaction from us as your regulator. We're educating about potential non-compliance here. Then the last three items here are compliance orders, administrative penalty orders, and prosecution. So a compliance order is an order for a producer to take a specific action. An administrative penalty order is an order to pay a penalty, including any economic benefit that might have been derived from non-compliance. And then prosecution is quite self-evident as being prosecutorial powers from your regulator. So if you receive a compliance order or an administrative penalty, those are reactions from your regulator that because you, you there's an offense that's occurring in the top right-hand quadrant. Compliance orders, administrative penalty orders, those are publicly posted on our website along with your company information that what you're required to do in order to comply or the penalty and the economic benefit that you derived from that non-compliance that may need to be uh, recovered. So in order to avoid potential enforcement action from your regulator, you wanna take available to you these top steps here. Right now we're doing this education awareness, we're having communications with folks to ensure that we're addressing potential non-compliance. You wanna make sure your system is in place for July 1st, 2023 with that compliance matrix and with our progressive tools of compliance, you can predict what likely risk to your company is based on where we've assessed free riders in terms of our compliance risk matrix. We are here to help though. We are existing in these top buckets here. We are, we're here to, to have these conversations to help producers understand what they need to do and to be able to perform. We're not here to issue administrative penalties. My goal as a regulator is to get compliance without ever issuing a compliance order or an administrative penalty. If there is a way to get compliance without issuing an administrative penalty, that is the route I would like to go. So let's work together to try to make sure producers have everything they need to have in play for July 1st so that you're able to comply. Next slide. So this is just summarizing what I've said. Uh, 
you need to determine now how you're going to meet your obligations. RPRA right now existing in that top bucket of, of compliance tools will be contacting individual producers to ensure they are ready to lead up to July 1st, 2023. So we're not getting to July 1st, 2023 and it's a surprise. Will not be a surprise. Everyone knows they need to figure out now, how are they going to fulfill that obligation? Likely involves conversations with your pros. Uh, there are, we've got a slide coming up that talks about who the pros are, where more resources are to, to be able to suss this out for your company and figure out which pro you want to select or if you want to call our PRA and have a conversation with us about how you think you might be able to establish this on your own and provide services to millions of producers or millions of um, consumers in Ontario. Next slide. So what should you take away from today? Next slide. First up, you're having these conversations with your pros. Uh, do not wait until June 30th because you want this set up for July 1st. If you wait, you may not be able to get it set up for July 1st. You may not be able to indicate to your regulator that you have in fact established a collection system on July 1st. You need to be able to demonstrate that. And if you can't, then you could face enforcement action. So have these conversations with the pros and within five days of selecting a pro, notify RPRA. You can log into your registry portal and select them from the list. You've done your due diligence. You're sure that they're able to do what they need to do to comply. Being listed on RPRA's website as a pro is not some sort of authentication process. You, you need to make sure you are selecting a pro who can provide you the right services. There's an upcoming deadline, and this is different than the regulation. So I want to point this out for everyone. May 31st, 2023. You're going to be submitting your, your supply data. You've already submitted uh, your supply data last October 31st uh, in order to determine what your obligations are. There's an upcoming deadline to, to get ready for next year. So if you haven't submitted October 31st data, data, you're getting very behind and you are the first tranche, that first tier of free rider. So it is very important that you are logging in and completing that, that supply data report. But again, as I said, that's just the first step in making sure that you're not a free rider. July 1st, 2023, key date, you need to be ready. You need to be able to say, I have established a collection system. I have the ability to meet my management requirements. And you need to be working towards that now, not waiting for July 1st, 2023 in order to be able to do it. Then you've got some future requirements as well. And we're going to be having more uh, webinars about all of this in terms of what's performance, how this looks. Again, if we're thinking about this from that risk-based compliance matrix, my focus right now is making sure producers know they have a supply reporting deadline coming up and that they have a, a target of July 1st, 2023 to establish and operate a system. We can have conversations later about obligations that the producers or their pros acting on their behalf may have in future years. Next slide. Here are the registered pros so, so that you're able to contact them. If you reach out to them, they, they will want to have conversations with you. Um, as I've said, these are companies that have been set up to offer services uh, to assist you complying. So, so they will want to chat with you more about how they can help you and how they can provide those services to you. You're going to want to ask questions to make sure that you feel confident. Based on your own company, some, sometimes you, maybe you, you do select uh, an auditor to interact with CRA with you and, and you just select the one and, and, and you're good. Maybe, maybe your company doesn't. This is entirely your own business decision in terms of how you select these pros. We can't help you. Um, that your trade associations can, so they can certainly answer questions. Your own legal counsel, however you do normal procurement will help you figure out how to select one of these companies, but there is no longer just one. You need to make a decision on who you're working with in order to help satisfy your obligations. And that includes if you're running a supplemental system, you, there's some pros here who will help you run supplemental systems. So if you're concerned uh, because you want to make sure you're hitting your management requirements for particular materials, there are pros who are also available to help with those services. Next slide. There's a lot of resources available. We have websites, learning series, is the compliance and registry team, as I said, they're going to triage your questions. So if you're if you're sending in a question that says, 
what do I need to do? I need help with my, my reporting for May 31st. Right now, the focus of the team is making sure people are ready for July 1st. I know that might seem strange since one deadline is sooner than the other, but the more important deadline, you've already reported your October 31st de data to us last year that tells us what you have to do July 1st. What you're giving us May 31st is gonna tell, tell you and us what you need to do in 2024. The number one priority for this team is helping producers figure out how they comply July 1st, 2023. Next slide. I believe we're at the end with questions. So I'll pass it over to, to Monica to, to help us with some questions. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. And just before jumping into that, just a quick reminder that uh, this slide deck will be made available uh, via email and on our website and the webinar recording will be available as well, just in case anyone joined late or wants to uh, review any of the, the great information that Mary shared with us today. So with that, I'll jump into the questions. So the first two are actually quite similar, Mary. So um, they have to do with uh, checking management requirements. So I'm going to read the second one from the top just because it's got a bit more uh, um, there's a bit more, added. it's kind of a two-parter, I guess. Uh, where can we see if we have management requirements or not after we already reported to RPRA? So I, I did say that it's in your registry. So, so it's in your electronic portal. So when you go through and report to RPRA your supply data, it will actually tell you what your management requirements are. It'll tell you uh, whether you, you have any or not. And that way you'll be able to know, am I exempt? From, from management requirements, or do I need to set up a collection system? Sydney, did you have something to add? Yeah, I can just be uh, really specific for producers there. So what you're gonna wanna do is you're gonna log into your registry account. You're gonna navigate to the Blue Box program, and then you're gonna be looking for your 2022 supply report, which was your 2021 supply data. And beside that, you wanna click view or download the report, and then look for the section that says, your minimum management requirements for 2023. So that's where you'll see if you have management requirements or not. And if you haven't already submitted your supply data, your 2021 supply data in your 2022 report, um, your management requirements won't be there. So you have to make sure you get that reporting in to determine your management requirements. Great, thanks Mary and Sydney. So next question is, are there any pros that are not able to fulfill these obligations? How do we vet pros? That's a good question. Um, the pros are not vetted by RPRA as a regulator. Uh, and so it, it's a conversation that you need to have with the pro to figure out whether or not they can meet these different obligations. Your trade associations should be able to help you with that. I know many of them have materials available with questions to ask, how to figure out whether or not they can meet your obligation, what type of level of reporting throughout the year you may want from them in terms of whether you're they're fulfilling your obligation. So there's not a lot of advice that we can give as a regulator in terms of how you choose a, a, a private commercial contract and, and what you do to satisfy the needs in the terms of that contract, but there are others that can help you with that. Thank you, Mary. Next question is, which producers are not obligated to establish a collection and management system, and what would make them exempt? So really two things. The first stage is you may be exempt from registration and reporting if you're under a particular threshold, uh, it's 2 million uh, in, in sales. Uh, but then you also may be exempt from collection and management requirements if you don't have management requirements. So the regulation triggers particular exemption levels. As Sydney was just saying, if, you're, if you think your company is exempt, the registry portal will give you this information. And we can certainly uh, make sure that it's sent out as part of this. The, the instructions on exactly where to go if you didn't catch all those instructions from Sydney so that you can log in and see. Now, again, this is predicated on the fact that you've reported correctly. So you may be logging in, looking, seeing that you don't have management requirements and therefore saying, oh, I don't have collection requirements. I don't need a pro. But if you've reported incorrectly, that's where, report, where RIPRA gets into our inspections and we determine this and you do have management requirements then you the data is going to change and you're going to have to, to to get a pro to assist you or to figure out how to comply on your own. So make sure you have reported correctly if you're relying on that. Thanks, Mary. So next question is, is there more information on the promotion and education component? In terms of what producers need to comply with? I'm not sure what the, the question is. Uh, they don't elaborate, but uh, I guess in relation to, to uh, your presentation. 
So, so in terms of PE requirements, if you're retaining a pro to perform those uh, requirements on your behalf, the pro will will outline everything that they're doing so that you can be sure that they're complying with your PE requirements. At a high level, it's ensuring Ontario consumers know what goes in the blue bin so that you're able to increase recycling. Minimum PE requirements are minimum PME requirements in the regulation. If you take a look at things and think of it from, from a holistic point of view, uh, if I have management requirements, right, I'm participating in this curbside collection system. If I don't do my best to educate consumers and make sure my pro is educating consumers, I may operate an amazing collection system that no Ontario consumer knows how to use, and I'm not going to achieve my management requirements. So, so while there are minimum PE requirements in the regulation, uh, those PE requirements are there uh, as a minimum level standard uh, to, to provide Ontario consumers with what goes into the blue bin. What doesn't go into the blue bin? Producers are paying 100% for this. If, if Ontario consumers are putting the wrong things in the blue bin, that also drives costs for, for producers. So you're going to want to make sure that, that your pro is educating Ontario consumers for a lot more than just what's required in the regulation, but you're going to want to talk to the, the pros about that and what their, their P&E plans look like and how they're going to meet your management requirements with those P&E requirements. Thank you. And uh, maybe if I can oh, just sorry. jump in, I'll just add one thing. Just there is a bit more information about promotion and education, the minimum requirements on our website on the producer web page. And same goes, um, there's also a bit more information there about collection and management requirements. If somebody is looking to, to read up a bit more about those minimum requirements. Thanks, Sydney. So next question is, is it worth shopping around for a pro? Are their fees the same or the services they provide equal? So all pros are made differently. They probably all provide different services under the different regulations. Um, maybe they all have different fees. It's going to be, maybe they all have different fees for producers. These are conversations you're going to want to have, have with your, your pros, sort of going with the CRA and selecting accountant. Are all accountants made equal? Do they all have the same fees? Probably not, but you're going to have to have those conversations with those organizations. Your regulator can't answer those questions. Uh, only those providing those services and charging for those can. So uh, how much you shop around, what you do, the questions you ask, all of those are, are questions that you should be happily having. Your trade associations know a lot of this information can provide you a lot more of that information than, than your regulator can. Um, but, but it's ultimately up to your own company's decision. How much do you shop around for other compliance services? Great, thanks. So next question is, can we operate a supplemental collection directly at our, oh, I'm so sorry skipped ahead there, uh, directly at our retail locations, i.e. collecting plastic back from customers. You can operate, uh, there's a variety of different ways to operate a supplemental collection system, and that would be one of them. There are requirements that, that you need to, to meet in order to, to qualify as a supplemental collection system. So if you have a specific program that you want to run through with us so that we can figure out what you need to do in order to operate that as a supplemental and get that material back and count it towards your management requirements. I strongly encourage you to talk to the team uh, in order to, to get that set up. Great, thanks. Uh, I think you touched on this a little bit in the question before last, but uh, the next question here is, is there a fixed fee schedule for the service of a pro? So I, I wouldn't know. Uh, you're gonna have to talk to the pros. Uh, I know in, in other regulations and in this regulation, it, it's entirely dependent on, on the pro, the services they're providing, the negotiation you have, whether it could be that one, two producers with the same pro don't, don't have the same services and that's fine. It's an entirely up to, to, to you and the pro to have that conversation and figure out what, what they want. Um, I think some pros will have set fee schedules, but uh, that's just based on on what I'm seeing on on websites. As a regulator, we are not involved in a private commercial conversation between you and a pro. Great, thank you. So the next question here is: uh, Is it July each year that will be the deadline? For example, we are under the threshold this year, but perhaps we go over next year. How much time mm -hmm. is next year? Do you have to find a pro? So July first is is the transition date. So July first is the date that you need to make sure 
that, that you either have a pro or a system in place to comply. If you, let's say, reported your data October 31st and you've taken a look and you know it's accurate, you know it's correct, it can be relied on, you follow the steps that, that Sydney's given you and you've taken a look and it says you don't have management requirements, but then this May 31st, you log in, report your data and the same system comes back and says you do have management requirements, then you need a pro for that performance year. So for July, for, sorry, so May 31st of this year will be dictating next year's performance requirements, not this year. So you'll have more time to get a pro. But next year, the reporting, the collection system has to be in place January 1st, not July 1st. So you need That's to make sure point. you have that pro in place for January 1st to meet your 2024 management requirements. Correct. Great, thanks. So next question is, is Ontario moving towards two stream or single stream program? Um, very important to know when thinking about p and &E programs. So that's entirely up to the producers. They are now fully accountable financially for and, and from an operational perspective of this entire system. There are requirements during a transition period. So there's not going to be this knee jerk change happening on July 1st. There is a, a three year transition period where the pros are, are operating the system much like Ontario residents have been used to for, for several years. Uh, but once they become fully, the transition's over and they're fully and completely uh, in control of the system. So that, that'll be in three years. Uh, it's entirely up to them to make decisions on how, how the system's going to be run. Thank you. So next question here, can you please provide an overview of a uh, excuse me, a municipality's requirements if they meet the minimum thresholds? So I think this is a municipality who may be a producer because that's the, the topic we're on. And so uh, it would be any producer. So, so not just a municipality who have these requirements. So any producer, for example, a municipality who are also producers because they send things out, they supply things into the Ontario, Ontario market. If they meet those thresholds, so when they go in, report their, their data, their blue box obligated supply data, and they get to the end of the process and the registry informs them that they do in fact have management requirements, the obligations that we've covered would be to set up a curbside, to ensure they're established a curbside collection system for all of the millions of Ontario residents, including depot, making sure that they're hitting their management requirements and recovering the material uh, that they're, they're required to under the regulation. Um, they'll, they have the same process to go through as any other producer, which is how am I going to achieve that? How am I going to establish that? Am I going to have a conversation with a pro? Am I going to attempt to do this on my own and talk to RPRA before July 1st of 2023? So it's the same, whether you're a municipality who is a producer or a corporation who is a, well, municipalities are, but or a manufacturer of a product or packaging who has obligations. Thanks for that. Uh, so next question here, how long will we be paying dues obligate dues slash obligations to Stewardship Ontario and RPRA. My understanding is that one would transition into the other and Stewardship Ontario would no longer require registry annual dues. So in terms of how long you pay to Stewardship Ontario, that's a question for Stewardship Ontario. So, so reach out to Stewardship Ontario, take a look at your steward rules and, and that'll tell you that. What I do want to make clear though is, is something there that I caught. You're not paying into RPRA instead of Stewardship Ontario. And that's kind of the theme that we're talking about here. You, you are registering and reporting and paying a fee to, to RPRA as part of figuring out your regulatory obligations. And the fee you pay to RPRA is not to run a collection system and meet those obligations, but, but it is a fee that you're paying as a cost recovery organization. RPRA is a regulator recovering the cost from those we regulate to ensure that system set up. And then you have your pro. If you have decided you're, you're working with a pro, you will have some form of payment to your pro. So you've got Stewardship Ontario payments that are, are it is correct, will end. The fees you were paying to Stewardship Ontario incorporated regulatory oversight, everything all in one bucket, including, including operating the system. Eventually those will transition out. Talk to Stewardship Ontario about the obligations under the steward rules. Once that's done and there is a, a transition period here, you have fees to RPRA to regulate you, and then you will have fees to a pro to provide compliance services for you. Thanks, Mary. So next question is about supply reporting. The regulation states supply data reporting is April 30th each year. 
Will RPRA continue to maintain a May 31st supply reporting date this year and in subsequent years? Yes. Easy. <laughs> uh, so the next question, I think this person may be elaborating on a previous question. So I'm going to move down. Hopefully we can find that. Uh, so what is the appeal process uh, regarding, uh, sorry, excuse me, sorry. Uh, what is the appeal po process pre-compliance order to an RPRA decision? pre -compli Okay, so pre-compliance order. So if uh, you're working with an inspector or an officer on the team and they give you direction uh, that you disagree with for whatever reason it may be, you can just simply ask to speak to, to someone else about this, to have your, your case reviewed, to have your position reviewed. If we have our own internal process that it goes through, uh, we are looking at getting a portion of that process public so, so that people can see what the steps look like. So we are working on getting that post posted, but there is a process then it goes through in terms of going to the compliance manager, compliance operational lead. And depending on the case, it could actually uh, come to me for, for review as well. Uh, so there is an internal process that goes through. Ultimately though, uh, it's up to, to the producer to, to figure, to, to trigger that and say, I'd like to speak to someone about this. Um, I'd like to speak to the manager, compliance person, anyone to, to have that reviewed and to better understand. If it's an overarching decision, so by that, what I mean is, say we've issued an FAQ on this. So it, it's not just an email from an inspector or an officer, or we've issued a compliance bulletin on this. There's actually a process outlined so that you can understand why that decision has been taken. It's something that we can make sure that we can also include in terms of uh, getting a response from the registrar about a particular overarching compliance decision. So there's your own individual case. So if it's just you and it's just impacting you, you can just simply ask to, to, to have your case reviewed. If it's a, it's a documentation on our website, a bulletin, an FAQ, there's a process in terms of saying, we'd like to better understand this uh, decision. Great, thanks so much, Mary. Um, so next question here, just... Uh... Trying to overlap with our team, who's also um, hard at work answering questions at the back end here. So uh, the top question here is the 2023 minimum management requirements are in terms of kilograms of plastic, rigid plastic, metal, etc. Does it mean uh, does this mean the company has to talk to its pro to let them know the quantities um, and the materials that they need to collect? That's also between you and your pro. So it depends on how your pro is charging fees, how they're providing services, what data they need. There is no legal regulatory requirement for a producer to provide that data to a pro, but there could be contractual need. So if you've signed a contract that says you're giving that to your pro, then that's between you and your pro and, and your contractual arrangement. So while there's no requirement for it, there are many pros who, who do require that type of information in order to fulfill your compliance obligations. So it's between you and them, what data you give them. The only requirement under this regulation is that you do provide it to our PRA. Great, thanks so much. Uh, so next question is, can you please expand further on the definition of alternative and supplemental collection systems and how they can help companies meet their management requirements? Sure, so a supplemental system, let's see. It's funny because it's fun to give examples because if, if we give examples, I think it'll click for everyone, but I don't want to, to give examples. Um, so we'll try to try to be generic here about a supplemental system. Um, it, a supplemental system might be a system that you uh, you, you supply your product to, to a consumer. You've got the curbside system. Your, your pros may be established in operating that for you, but you have an in-store take-back program. For a component, all of it, maybe it's uh, the product itself you, you want to get back. Uh, maybe it's the, the packaging around the product that you're getting back. You set up a system in order to get that back from your consumer. So you're telling the consumer, don't put that in your blue bin. Bring that back to me. I want that. That's a supplemental system to the curbside collection system. And what you collect from that program, whether maybe it's a mail back program where you've got a bag and you're putting your product in the bag when you're done and zipping it up and mailing it back to the company or taking it to the store because you wanna buy a new one and you get a discount on the second one. Those are our programs that would be considered supplemental. And when the producer's doing their resource recovery, whether that's recycling, whatever it might, might be under the regulation, anything that's collected through that system for the producer gets to count towards their management requirements. An alternative system is 
alternative to all of this. So it's a completely different idea, different. If you're able to recuperate every bit, every single thing that you're supplying as an obligated producer without participating in a curbside collection program, there is no consumer who's putting, putting items into the curbside collection bin of yours. You're operating completely separate alternative system to it. Then you have an alternative collection system. If you think you have an alternative collection system, you can get out of your obligations, if you will, not get out of, but you, you fulfilled your obligations differently than through the curbside collection system. You really need to talk to us now. Don't say, oh, I think I can figure you want to have those conversations with the compliance team today to say, I have an alternative system and this is what it is. And you have a whole other different pathway of obligations and reporting to us that you have to fill, fulfill in order to, to run an alternative collection system. So it's, it's not a philosophical concept of, well, I get my material back this way. So I run an alternative collection system. There is quite a bit that you need to fulfill to do that. So do contact us so that we can have those conversations. Thank you. So next question. Uh, our PRA provides information on the roles of the key stakeholders, uh, producers, municipalities, First Nation communities, processors, and a pro, and how they interact with our PRA. Can you speak to how our PRA will interact with the CCS administrator, uh, such as auditing, compliance, et cetera? There's no such thing in the regulation. Um, so our PRA as a regulator has no role over the administrator or with the administrator, only with pros. Thank you. Uh, what if we collect other people's blue box waste at our location? I think I think this is getting at some sort of what if I operate a supplemental collection system and I'm collecting other people's things at that same system. Um, so you're collecting obligated blue box material and you can certainly utilize that to meet your management requirements as long as it's obligated blue box material. So there are things that are not obligated blue box material that if you're collecting them, they seem like it, it might be, maybe they're even made of metal. And, and so you want to count it, or maybe they're from a source that isn't residential. You cannot count that. It has to be obligated blue box material that, that you're counting towards your management requirements. Maybe I'll just jump in because this is a misconception that I hear a lot. And that's that you have to, that this program somehow obligates a producer to take back their own materials. So you're supplying a paper bag and you have to get that exact paper bag back. That's not the intention. You're going to have a management requirement for paper and you'd be ex expected to ensure that an equivalent amount of paper is collected and managed in Ontario. So it's not necessarily about getting your branded product back. It's about collecting it and managing an equivalent amount of the same material. Sorry about that. Um, so let's see. Uh, I'll just uh, read this one aloud just uh, for everyone's uh, benefit here. Can you provide a link to all the webinars available for producers of blue box items? Maybe we can share where those can be found online. Mm -hmm. Of course. I think somebody maybe can either follow up with the email banking after this webinar with some more information and resources. And I also think it was on a previous slide. So I know we're sharing this deck and I know we're sharing uh, this, this recording. So the link will be there as well. Great, thank you. Um, again, sorry, just trying to make sure I don't overlap with our team who's uh, diligently answering questions as well. Um, what is the process for amending a previously submitted report filed with RPRA if an error has been discovered? Ah, yes. So reach out to the team. Uh, just simply let them know. So that's registry at RPRA. Uh, let them know that there, there's been an error. Um, let them know the reason for the, the error, the, what the error was, what the change in the data is. They will probably have follow-up questions for you. Uh, so, so they may have a, a series of questions about how it occurred, what happened, making making sure that that if we're making this change to your data, that that everything will be. We don't. The last thing we want is repeated changes to the same data. It's the last thing you want as well. So we'll do a little due diligence to make sure that that process is followed, and then the the data has changed. It's your data to us. Um, so if you need to change it, we we will change that. What you need to be aware of is when you change that data, you have implications to your management requirements, which may then have implications to what you, you actually need to perform. So if you wait three years to, to tell us my data is my incorrect, 
will absolutely help you fix that data, but you may then be out of compliance with your management requirements. So we'll have those conversations. Don't take that as a, I shouldn't fix my data because you want to have this dialogue with us as a regulator. We're, we're about education, awareness, communication. So you don't want to hope that we don't find it but in terms of an inspection. You do want to come to us and talk to us about it. Um, just be aware. It's really important. You are getting your data correctly. It is uh, a very important aspect of IPR that an individual producer is getting their data correct when they report it into their regulator because a lot of flow through obligations are based on that data. Thank you, Mary. Um, and thank you, Sydney, as well for helping answer those questions. Looks like we've cleared up the queue there, actually. Um, so unless there's anything either of you wanted to add, we can um, maybe get some feedback from our participants just to make sure that uh, that future webinars are, are as useful as possible. So we'll go ahead and launch our poll now. So if you could just yeah. take a minute to answer that, that'd be wonderful. waiting for our responses to come in here. Give it another minute. Um, in the meantime, we actually do have a couple more questions that came in. If uh, Mary, Sydney, if we've got just a bit more time. Yeah, okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll. So get your answers in. Thank you everyone for participating. All right, and we'll just uh, go ahead with a new question that we just got. So bear with me, it's a, it's a long one. Uh, the concept of meeting our management requirement through collecting the equivalent amount of the same material and not just our specific produced material is conflicting with what we have been told to date. Can you confirm that this is in fact true? if our collection system is located at a non-eligible source. We operate and pay for a campus collection system. We pay for a collection of material generated by others. If we produce, uh, produce in quotes, uh, material in these same categories, can we count this as a deduction? So there is a lot of information in there and that person should contact the registry team. That is very specific. I wanna make sure we're giving you exactly the information. There was words deduction, eligible sources, a lot in there that I want to unpack. At a high level, what I can say is what reiterate what Sydney said. If you supply um, cardboard paper uh, and, and it says your brand on it, you're getting back cardboard paper to, to meet your management requirements, not the cardboard paper with your name on it. Um, that would be unfeasible. Uh, so, so I can, I, the beginning of that was just reiterating what Sydney had said there is, is correct, but that was a very detailed question. Let's have a conversation. So reach out to the registry team to make sure that, that you, you get the answer you need there. Great. Thanks, Mary. And just as a reminder, the email to reach the registry team is registry at rpra.ca. Great. So if that's everything, I will go ahead and, uh, hand it over to either Mary or Sydney if you have just some, if, any last uh, bits of advice or information to share with uh, all our participants today, will you? So I think the closing remarks, the, the theme, I hope the, the key message you're hearing here uh, is that free riders are of utmost importance to our PRA. You may not be a free rider today, but you could be tomorrow, could be on July 1st. To avoid being a free rider, you need to make sure you are doing everything that needs to happen between now and July 1st. We are here to help. There will hit a limit to our help. We can't give you business advice. We can't say that's a good rate. We can't say, yes, that pro has a great plan. Pick them. We cannot do that. There are those out there in your sphere who can, you can have those conversations with that might be able to provide you at least the questions to ask to prepare yourselves. But do not think I've registered and I've reported to RIPRA, I'm good or I've registered and reported to RIPRA and I'm paying fees to Stewardship Ontario, I'm good. There is more to happen here 
And come July 1st, 2023, if you are a free rider, we've explained our compliance framework for a reason. It's so that you can predict the risk to your company. So I think on that note, if we don't have any other questions, we'll let folks go. Monica? Thanks, Mary. Thank you to everyone else uh, who attended. Uh, all the information will be distributed, as we mentioned, and uh, it will be available on our website. Thanks, everyone, and hope everyone has a, a great rest of the day. Take care. Take care. Bye. Bye.